to talk about this concept of caliphates because we've heard you know, a fair bit about that in recent times, particularly with the rise of ISIS. Uh, you know, look, what's very important to note is that the word there is no such thing as a particular political system as far as Islam is concerned. And I say that because um, you know, in, in, in the field of Islamic studies we would consider the Quran and, the, and the, most would say the traditions of the Prophet Muhammad to be the basic sources. And if we look at these sources, we don't find any blueprint for a political system in the Quran or in, in the uh, traditions of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, we have verses like this. Um, and God said to the angels, Behold, I will establish on earth um, one who shall inherit it. And the word Khalifa is used in reference to the one who shall inherit it. Uh, and we have, you know, human beings generally are referred to as Khalifa or inheritors of the earth in a number of other verses that I've mentioned here. Uh, now, I think for all of you here, your reading of this is not that there's a particular political system mentioned here. It's simply saying that human beings are a superior species to other species that we find on the planet, and human beings have a responsibility uh, to the earth and to, you know, social order on the earth. That's what the Quran is talking about here. There is no mention of any particular political system at all, um, uh, especially not in reference to this concept of Khalifa. So where, do, where does the justification come from? Where do they, what do they base their idea on that Islam is advocating for a particular political system that they refer to as a Khalifa? Um, <clears throat> one of the verses in the Quran reads like this, O you who have attained faith, or it's a reference to Muslims, uh, pay heed unto God and pay heed unto the Apostle and unto those among you who, are, who is entrusted with authority. And if you are at variance over any matters, refer it to God and the Apostle if you believe in God in the last day. That is literally the verse that people refer to to say Islam advocates a political system called a caliphate. I mean, it's quite a vague verse. It doesn't even use the word khalifa in, in that particular verse at all. And um, if you look at the way scholars historically have interpreted this verse, they say it's a general statement about because Islam is a religion, according to the Quran, uh, that provides people with basic guidance. Um, the Quran itself says this is a book of guidance to all of humankind. And so guidance is, is needed by human beings in a whole range of different aspects of life. And so what this verse is referring to is if you're seeking guidance, seek it from God, i.e. from the Quran, or seek it from the Prophet Muhammad, i.e. from his traditions, or those of you who, are, who know, who, who have an understanding about things, who have, a, have authority, or have been entrusted to give this kind of advice. That's all this verse is saying. The fact that the people who advocate this idea of caliphate are clutching at straws like this um, should tell everybody that they don't have a very strong case. Let's have a look at Muslim empires as they evolve throughout history, and you'll understand this whole concept of caliphate are much, much better. The term is first used after the death of the Prophet Muhammad. The Prophet Muhammad didn't leave behind any successor. Um, but what he did do, he, he united the Arab tribes who had previously not been united in their history. He gave them uh, a, uh, a social system. Uh, he gave them social order. He gave them a concept of the rule of law. Um, and he brought them together in a way where they might play some significant role in their own destiny as opposed to being, you know, at, at, you know, at the mercy of the Byzantine on one hand or the, or the Sassanids on the other. And so after Muhammad's death, they figured, well, you know, let's not let this slip away. You know, we had the chance to, to be somebody, you know, on the, on the map, uh, so to speak. And so a group of the Prophet's companions met after the death of the Prophet Muhammad and they discussed what should we do next. And it was suggested that we need to appoint a leader here. And then it was suggested that this leader needs to come from the tribe of the Quraysh because historically they, are the, they have been the dominant tribe in Arabia. And it was suggested that a particularly close companion of the Prophet Muhammad, in fact the first person who converted to Islam, his name was Abu Bakr, that he should be the first caliph. He should be the first representative of the Prophet Muhammad, or the, or the first successor to the Prophet Muhammad. 
And that is where the title came from. So this was something that was decided in a very ad hoc way by a group, a group of Muslim people who were companions of the Prophet Muhammad after Muhammad's death. It's not as though they said, all right, Muhammad's passed away now. Uh, what are we going to do? Let's uh, look up the Quran here to find out what political system we have to implement. No such thing, because there's nothing said in the Quran. There's no, when the story of this occasion is told, there's no Quranic verse mentioned. There's no prophetic traditions mentioned. It all happens in an ad hoc way. It all happens, uh, you know, according to circumstances. And so we see a situation where there are four, what are referred to as Rashidun, or rightly guided caliphs. Abu Bakr is the first, he rules for two years, he passes away. On his deathbed, he appoints the second one, Umar, to be the second caliph. Umar rules for ten years, he's assassinated. Uh, and then, uh, he, as he's, well, he's stabbed, and so when he's dying, he appoints a committee of six, and he tells them, choose one from among yourselves. They choose one. Uh, his name is Uthman, he rules for twelve years. He's also assassinated, and after his death, the, the community basically elects the fourth caliph, his name is Ali. Uh, I'll just be a second. Uh, <clears throat> and so you have here four rulers, um, four different modes of election, four different modes of succession. Um, none of these have any reference in the Quran or the prophetic traditions. It was all done according to circumstances. Yes. In the case of Umar, it was uh, a, a Persian, you know, uh, no, it wasn't from the Muslim community, but in the case of Uthman, it was from disgruntled Muslims. Um, there, were, there were disgruntled Muslims in Iraq, in Kufa and Basra, and in Egypt. I a question, I'm sorry. Oh, the question was, who were the assassinators? So they came from these um, outer-lying provinces, descended on Medina, and uh, a, a smaller group of them assassinated Uthman, the third caliph. Ali becomes the fourth caliph, and... Here we go. Now, there was a question earlier about Sunni and Shia. All of this discussion revolves around Sunnis because it's Sunnis that advocate the concept of the caliph, the caliphate. Um, we don't find this in Shiism. Shiism have a different system where they say the ruler of the Muslim community must be a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad through the family of Ali, the fourth caliph. Right? So they have a different system. So all of this discussion is taking place in the context of Sunnis. And for those of you, uh, just for your information, Sunnis make up the majority of the Muslim world. About 85 to 90 percent of the world Muslim population is Sunni, and a much smaller proportion is Shia. Uh, today, uh, Iran is a, is a Shia Muslim state, but you also find um, significant populations of Shias in Lebanon, in Afghanistan, also in Pakistan, even in Saudi Arabia. Um, Iraq, obviously, as well. Okay, so after the time of the Rashidun, uh, you know, this is considered the golden age or a glory period for Muslims. Um, how so, really? I mean, you've got, you know, two of them were assassinated, and then civil war broke out at the time of the uh, fourth caliph. Um, he, was then, he was then assassinated as well uh, by the Khawarij, that group I mentioned earlier. So because Ali accepted arbitration, he accepted to sit down with, uh, you know, his other Muslim enemies, and, and have an arbitration, he was considered to have committed a major sin uh, by the Khawarij, and then they, execute, then they assassinated him. Interestingly enough, ISIS has said that Hamas has, has delegitimized Hamas, and said because they accepted a ceasefire with Israel, they are also worthy of being targeted with violence. And so they said, you know, before we march on Israel, we'll be going after Hamas first. Uh, so exactly the same kind of thinking as the Khawarij back in the 7th century. So, essentially what happened was, at the time of this fourth caliph, Ali, you have a split in the Muslim community. Those who backed the governor of Syria, his name was Mawia, he was the cousin of the third caliph who got assassinated. There's his camp, and there's those who support Ali. Within Ali's camp, the group called the Khawarij broke away. So they are an offshoot of Ali's supporters, and they're the ones who eventually assassinated him. When he was assassinated, the rule of the Muslim world, or the Muslim community at the time, or the empire, passed to the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad, Hassan. He didn't really, wasn't really up for the task, so he uh, abdicated, and uh, Mawia, the, the nephew of the third caliph, he becomes the ruler, and we start this new uh, empire, the Umayyads. Most of these are now based on clans. The Umayyad was a clan of the Quraysh tribe. And so they take over rule, and they end up ruling from 661 until 750. 
It's during their time that the empire expand, expands you know, quite vastly. They're defeated um, in 750, but all is not lost because they had, they had also conquered uh, land in Spain. And so from 780 until 1031, they had a caliphate in Spain. And then subsequent Muslim empires continued to rule in Spain all the way up until 1492, when Granada fell to Ferdinand and Isabel. Um, back in the um, main part of the Muslim world, we have the Abbasid Caliphate uh, from 750 until uh, they were sacked by the Mongols in 1258. Simultaneously, we have other caliphates being established in North Africa, Syria and Egypt. This was the Fatimid Caliphate that lasted from 909 until 1171. Then we also have the Ottoman Caliphate uh, from 1517 until 1924. I put 1517 there because that's when they ruled in the Middle East, as opposed to when they ruled in Central Asia or modern-day Turkey. Abdul Hamid II is an, is an important character here because uh, he, was, he revitalized the title of Caliphate uh, for the Ottomans. The Ottomans, until his time, used it kind of ceremoniously. Salim I, who, who ruled in Egypt, used it. But then Ottomans after him didn't really use the title of Caliphate other than sort of ceremonially. They more used the title of Sultan. But Abdul Hamid II came back to the idea of using it and thinking of the Ottomans as rulers of the entire Muslim world. Um, as you can see here, a lot of these empires are overlapping. So this idea of a single united Islamic empire uh, or a caliphate uh, ruled by a single ruler is actually the exception rather than the norm as far as Islamic history is concerned. And then you have others like the Mughals in India also using the title of Khalifa as well. So a range of different empires have used this and we don't see a single unified Muslim Caliphate other than in the time of the Rashidun. And this was a, a period that lasted from 632 until 661 and involved the assassination of three out of the four uh, you know, rulers. So hardly, hardly a great period from that perspective. So where do we get this idea of, of an Islamic system of government called a caliphate? Because what I've shown you here is it all happens in a very ad hoc way um, his, from, a, from a historical perspective. It gets legitimacy when various Sunni Muslim scholars from the 10th century through to the uh, from the 11th century through to the 15th century, advocate this idea. And they make the argument that this is part of an Islamic system, it's a requirement in Islam, um, either due to, uh, on the basis of reason, or on the basis of revelation. If they say revelation, they quote that very vague, obscure verse that I mentioned earlier, just here. <coughs> and that's, that's pretty much their only um, justification or evidence for this. So it's quite flimsy. But in any case, these are considered to be quite towering figures as far as uh, Islamic political theory is concerned, particularly this guy, Al-Marwadi, uh, who died in 1058. But these scholars have all contributed to this idea that the caliphate is an Islamic system. And they present varying evidence, justifications and theories for this. But if you look at it overall, objectively, um, we can't deny the point that what happened in Muslim history happened in a very ad hoc way. There is no evidence in the Quran or in the prophetic traditions for a system called a caliphate. Um, it's as simple as that. In 1925, uh, an important book was written. This is a year after the uh, abolition of the Ottoman caliphate. So this is the end of the whole concept of caliphate in the Muslim world. This book was written by an Al-Azhar University scholar called Ali Abdul Razik. And he wrote basically a book that said exactly what I'm telling you today, that there is no Islamic basis for uh, a system called caliphate. That in fact, the Quran doesn't have a particular view about any particular political order, and this is open to people to decide for themselves what the appropriate political order is or should be. And it's interesting that a number of your contemporary Muslim political leaders, like Anwar Ibrahim, Rajib Tayyip in Malaysia, Rajib Tayyip Erdogan in Turkey, or Rashid Ghanouchi in Tunisia, are saying exactly the same thing. That we need a political system that reflects our needs. And it just so happens that democracies um, have proven to serve people um, best you know, in, the, in the modern world. And so that is a system of government that is most appropriate, rather than this kind of caliphate stuff that has you know, been part of history that really hasn't 
uh, amounted to Muslim societies, uh, you know, uh, being at the forefront of humanity, and certainly not uh, today. In the, in the colonial era, we do have a number of others, after the collapse of the Ottomans, we do have uh, a number of others advocating for this idea of caliphate. Uh, we have Sharif Hussain bin Ali, who was supported by the British. Uh, you know, the other thing here is that we often hear references to ISIS, in fact, being supported by Western powers, covertly. Uh, and it's sort of, it's regarded as a conspiracy theory. I mean, if you think about it, um, you know, we've got the Iraqi army um, ostensibly tra trained by the Americans and other allied forces, so they should be good soldiers, but they're getting their ass kicked by ISIS, who seemingly haven't been provided with this training. So why is it that ISIS is so good? Where do they get their training from? We know that they, the formations, um, the way they operate, uh, you know, are very sophisticated as far as Islamic militant groups go. So, you know, where do they get their training from? Where do they get their weapons from? Is an important question that really is unanswered. And if we look back in history, we can see most of these um, Islamic groups, including those that resulted in the formation of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, um, Sharif Hussein um, in Saudi Arabia as well, who fought against the Ottomans, all of them had been supported by uh, Western powers, particularly the British. So that's a, that's a common thread, and that's, that's, a, that's a standard part of Muslim history and the history of Muslim militant groups. Uh, he was supported by the British against the Ottomans. Um, he declared himself a, the Caliph of Hijaz, which is that uh, western part of, of the Arabian Peninsula in 1916, with British support. He was eventually defeated by Abdulaziz bin Saud, um, who established the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in 1932. Um, it's interesting to note that when he was defeated, um, the British sort of withdrew and let those two fight it out, and then they went and backed uh, the King of Saudi Arabia. And then by the 1940s, we have the Americans backing uh, Saudi Arabia uh, in terms of ensuring uh, or guaranteeing the protection of the regime in exchange for flow of oil. Uh, so that, that's, that's fairly well known. Also in Egypt, we have others like King uh, Fawad I, also advocating for to become the caliph um, over there as well. Uh, but of course, Ali Abdul Razik's book written in 1925 you know, put a damper on that, um, that idea to some extent. So we come today to, you know, various movements around the Muslim world that advocate for this caliphate. Um, a group by the name of Hezbo Tahrir, with which you might be familiar. Um, this is a, a, basically a non-violent group, but they do advocate for a global, you know, government uh, ruled by a caliph, uh, a system they call the caliphate. Um, Al-Qaeda similarly had a view that they wanted to restore the Caliphate. Um, Jama'a Islamiyah had, had a view that they wanted to establish a Caliphate in Southeast Asia. And then we've got ISIS, ISIL or IS, whatever you want to call them, um, also advocating this view today. It seems as though um, those particularly Al-Qaeda and uh, ISIS and, and Hezbollah Tahrir advocate a view that all of the lands that were historically part of a Muslim empire should be part of this Caliphate. Interestingly enough, when um, this Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi declared himself a caliph back in June, um, none of the other groups accepted him as the leader, though. So the odds of this happening are, I would say, you know, extremely low, uh, because you know, even though they're all advocating for this idea, none of them are in agreement with each other about it. So this is a map that shows you the Muslim world historically, and uh, the parts that you see um, from uh, across Spain and Portugal, across North Africa, including the Arabian Peninsula and up into uh, Central Asia, all the way over to India. These were historically part of the Islamic Caliphate. And you would have to extend that um, through Turkey um, into various parts of, uh, of, of southern Europe here, because they were also part of the Ottoman Empire. So as you can see, this is the kind of territory that uh, groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda are advocating for to be part of the caliphate that they envision. Any questions up to this point? We're going pretty well for time, so that's good. Yes? So you don't feel that there will be anybody that will agree on sort of things, that it's like for a leader, like there's no one that release the statement and all these groups would say may not necessarily agree, but at least No. First of all, these groups don't agree with each other. 
um, and that's why we, we do see them as distinct groups. Um, secondly, they don't have the support of the overwhelming majority of the Muslim world. Um, your average Muslim disagrees with them, um, and all of your Muslim leaders uh, and scholars and so forth all disagree with them as well. Um, so their ideas have been comprehensively rejected. Um, the other thing, the other important point to note is that, you know, while the Muslim, the modern Muslim nation states really only came into existence uh, basically from the, you know, around the 1950s onwards, um, that idea of nation states, while new in the Muslim world, has become very much entrenched. Uh, and, and you see very strong nationalism has developed in most Muslim countries today. And so to, to change uh, you know, that, that structure of nation states to something more comprehensive like this, uh, I don't think is palatable to the majority of Muslims around the world. Um, and certainly the existing Muslim governments are not in favour of this. If you look at an organisation like the OIC, the Organisation of Islamic Cooperation, which is a transnational uh, Islamic body, in fact it's the largest transnational body after the United Nations, uh, consisting of the world's you know, Muslim majority countries, um, you can see in its constitution um, the whole idea of nation states and their sovereignty is entrenched uh, in, in the constitution of the OIC. So there's no space in that thinking for this you know, historic, comprehensive, you know, Islamic world government sort of thing. It doesn't exist there. And I would say, you know, beyond that, the, the key point is the majority of Muslims around the world uh, you know, aren't in favour of, of this, and they, they certainly don't support militant groups like Al-Qaeda or, or uh, ISIS. Yes, up the back. Well, it's not a conspiracy theory to suggest that um, the resources in these areas are, are part of key strategic interests uh, you know, in the Muslim world. If you look at um, the very first foreign policy document that was uh, presented in 1992, at the time of Bush Sr. in the United States, this was the first time the US had, a, had an express policy towards the Muslim world. Um, it's referred to as the Meridian House Address. And uh, in that document, basically the United States makes it clear that it doesn't have a particular view about religion or Islam, and uh, you know, it, it deals with nations irrespective of their religious you know, affiliation. But what it does say is the US foreign policy towards the Muslim world is based on three pillars. First one is oil, that the United States seeks to have uh, secure access and flow of oil. The second thing is Israel, that the United States seeks to support Israel, and the third is uh, you know, a small, much smaller pillar that is about human rights, women's rights, um, political pluralism, etc. Yep. So that does support that. You know, the same, the people say that the CIA is behind the ISIS media. So what you're saying, what you're saying now to me is, 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 what, is obviously a possibility that they do might, that they might control ISIS. That CIA yeah. is the Sure. Well, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't have any evidence of that. All I can say is that if we look at it from an historical perspective, um, Western, um, you know, governments and intelligence agencies have always been supporters of various groups or, or another in the Muslim world. Um, they were backers of the Shah of Iran that brought him back into government uh, when the uh, democratically elected uh, Prime Minister of Iran, Mohammad Mossadegh, was overthrown in a coup. Um, they were backers of, you know, Sharif Hussain in, in Mecca. They were backers of the Saudis. Uh, you know, I mean, that's, that's the history of the, of the Middle East. There's always been a Western power that has supported the rise of these, uh, of these various groups. And so we shouldn't be surprised uh, that, you know, groups like ISIS or whatever uh, continue to have some support 
uh, today. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's it's entirely consistent with history. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. Any other questions now? Yes. Sorry, can you just clarify the difference between Sunni and Shia? Sure. So, 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 no, not at all. Not at all. Um, so they're historical. I mean, it goes back. The split begins at the time of the fourth caliph Ali. There were those who who said he should have been the first caliph. Um, they the they the Shias, and those that said, well, you know, it's entirely fine that he was the fourth. Um, the major difference relates to leadership and succession. Shias say that the only legitimate leader of a Muslim, you know, political entity uh, has to come from the family of the Prophet Muhammad, and more specifically from the family of Ali. Sunni say that's not necessarily the case. It could be anybody, um, you know, who's a Muslim, who's, you know, uh, endorsed by the, the people more popularly, even though that idea of election really wasn't um, a constant. Um, in Islamic history. So that's the main difference. One relies on lineage and the other one doesn't. So what was the issue in Iraq then that the government was a Shia government? Right. And somehow yeah. the Sunni Okay. So Sunni and Shia has become an important marker of Muslim identity um, in different parts of the Muslim world. I mean, that, that's the way we need to understand it. They're not fighting because, you know, Ali should have been the first caliph. No, he was the fourth. No, it's, I mean, that's, not, that's got nothing to do with it. It's about when a government gets in power, how they deal, do they deal equitably with people? And so historically Iraq was ruled by Sunnis um, and Shias were most likely marginalised during that time. Although some, you know, were in positions of privilege, um, many were marginalised at that time. Uh, and so now when the situation has been reversed, we have a Shia um, government in power. Sunnis have felt marginalised since, you know, the US invasion uh, in 2003. And so this has led to the rise of groups like ISIS, who are able to appeal to their fellow Sunnis that, hey, you know, we're getting a, a, an unfair deal here, um, and we need to, you know, fight back against this government. Basically, we want our rights. We want to be respected as equal citizens. And so that is, in large part, um, the appeal of groups like ISIS, because they're seen to be defending the rights of Sunnis, who feel as though their rights have been trampled on um, in the post-invasion period when a Shia government has come to power in Iraq. Yeah. Does that clarify it? And, that, and that's the same story in other parts of the Muslim world. In Lebanon, uh, people felt as though their rights were not represented, uh, their rights were not being met um, by one side or the other when, when you know, the other was in power. Yes, Robin? Um, uh, he was Sunni. Who's that? Saddam Hussein Saddam was a Sunni, yeah. That's right, yeah. Yeah, but you know, it's certain Shias were in, were in important positions within his government as well. Yeah. 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 It is over, all over the place. Yeah. Um, but you look where the oil wells are, and you get a sense of you know where the strategic interests lie. Okay. Uh, let's talk about appeal and recruitment. I have mentioned uh, in, in my lecture today that the overwhelming majority of Muslims reject groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda, etc. Uh, they regard what they're doing uh, as you know, inconsistent and uh, you know, you know, entirely uh, unacceptable as far as Islam's teachings are concerned, uh, particularly you know, the repression of minority groups, the killing of you know, minority groups, the way women are being treated, enslaved, and all, all of that kind of stuff, the killing of innocent people, all of this is rejected by the overwhelming majority of Muslims globally. That, that needs to be said. Um, however, there is some appeal uh, with groups like you know, ISIS and, and Al-Qaeda previously. And part of the reason is there are repressive Muslim governments, as we've just described, and particularly in the case of Iraq, Sunnis feel as though their rights are not respected uh, and that uh, you know, they're second-class citizens within their own country. If you think about what transpired after the Americans invaded, um, Sunnis were in a fairly, what we might say, privileged position at that time. Um, but what happened was the Americans reversed all of that. Uh, they disbanded the army that was largely comprised of Sunnis. So these people were now without a job. Uh, 
they removed people, I mean, because it was a, more of a socialist system, they removed people who were managers of, of the various factories, um, who, you know, in you know, many, most cases, were Sunnis as well. Um, they, no, they no longer have a job. Um, laws were passed that marginalised Sunni people, and so they became targets then of the new regime, uh, the Shias. And so the repressive governments uh, in the Muslim world play a very big role in um, why these militant groups emerge. If you look at the, um, you know, the policies and practices of Israel towards the Palestinians, um, anyone who's been there or studied it, it will come as no surprise to you whatsoever that groups like Hamas should emerge. Um, originally, Hamas was a non-violent group, um, but after 20 years of an, Isla an illegal Israeli military occupation, they said enough of this, and they combined their, you know, their Muslim Brotherhood social justice kind of ethics with the militant response uh, militant resistance of, of Fatah and said, now we're Hamas and we're going to fight against Israel and we're going to try to liberate you know, our land. Um, so the, the, the policies of governments play a big role in why you know, these various groups emerge. Uh, and you know, that's the case all, all over the Muslim world. Um, whenever you see these groups emerge, look at the policies of the government towards them and that'll go a long way to answer some of these questions. Um, the policies of Western, Western powers, foreign policies, are an important factor here. I mean, why invade Iraq? I mean, Saddam Hussein wasn't the only dictator. Um, Afghanistan, I mean, it wasn't the only, you know, almost failing state. You know, why choose those? Look at the consequences of those kinds of policies. Um, the interference in Muslim countries has led to quite dire results. A very good example is Iran. I mean, Iran had a democratically elected government back in the 1950s that was brought down by a CIA-engineered coup. I mean, Barack Obama himself has, has acknowledged this um, when he gave his famous speech in Cairo in 2009. Uh, and, you know, and then since then, what, what was the consequence? The Shah came back in, quite brutal policies, the people rebelled, and we've had, since that time, the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, so there's so many examples where we see, you know, these... Uh, you know, Afghanistan is another good example. Okay, the PDPA in Afghanistan um, was a very progressive government but had close relations with the Russians. So, the, at the time of... Uh, who was the president? Um, uh, Brzezinski was the foreign... Um, was the Secretary of State at the time. And they decided, let's, let's invest $500 million in the Mujahideen in, Af in Afghanistan to destabilise the PDPA. Um, and then, as a consequence of that, the Russians entered. And then there was a war between uh, Af the Afghanis and the Russians um, because, you know, we wanted to give Russia uh, their own Vietnam. Um, and what, what was the consequence of this? Eventually, the Taliban comes to power in Afghanistan. So there's been some really flawed policies uh, in respect to the Muslim world, and they continue until today. But I think we also have to acknowledge that there is, if we look around the Muslim world, particularly at young Muslims in the West, um, they, there's, there's an, an inadequacy as far as their Islamic education goes. Most of these people um, who find uh, the uh, groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda appealing um, really have a very limited understanding of, of Islam. There is a, there, they have a, if they do have any understanding at all, it tends to be a very puritanical, a very literalist interpretation informed by the Wahhabi ideology. Think about what Saudi Arabia has been able to do with its money. I mentioned about building mosques, but also publishing books and brochures, sending that all over the Muslim world, um, you know, information on the web as well, training imams, providing scholarships to young Muslims to go and study in Saudi Arabia, then they come back to their homeland, including places like Australia, and preach the Wahhabist ideology. This is how it gets spread around the world. Um, in their thinking, there's a complete lack of focus on the higher objectives, on, on purpose, on values, on principles, and it's all a very literalist interpretation. Um, Islam is not the only religion to suffer from this. Think about Christianity or Judaism. Um, when you have literalist interpretations, um, you have you know, these similar kinds of problems. But also, if you think about the way Muslims have um, imparted uh, knowledge of their own history, um, there's been an emphasis on battles and wars, and Muslims are not the only ones to do this. I mean, Western countries celebrate, you know, great wars and battles that we've, uh, you know, participated in, uh, you know, the glory of, of, of these kinds of occasions. Um, but it's detrimental in terms of, you know, how people see themselves and how they see the other. I mean, there's, there's an issue here. 
perhaps it's even an issue here in Australia, in our own society. Uh, there's apocalyptic prophecies that are all part of this. Uh, you know, here's a very interesting one that's been quoted quite widely since the rise of ISIS. Uh, this is attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, although, you know, I think it needs to be said that most of the prophetic traditions are not reliable. Uh, most of them, I mean, you would have to doubt the authenticity of them. Why? In the Prophet Muhammad's own lifetime, he forbade people from writing down prophetic traditions because he didn't want there to be any confusion between what he says and what was part of the Quran. And so his close companions who were writing down you know, statements he made and so forth burnt their, their, their books that they had compiled of his own statements. So his ruling during his own lifetime was this is not to take place. It was a couple of hundred years after the death of the Prophet Muhammad that we start to see the compilation of these prophetic traditions. I mean, it's very difficult. If, if you knew someone that passed away 10 years ago, how difficult is it to quote from what they had said or to, you know, I mean, to pass on, you know, what they did or what they said, it's extremely difficult. And we're, now we're talking like two and three hundred years after the death of Muhammad that Muslims supposedly are able to now, um, you know, restate what happened at the time of the Prophet Muhammad. If you look at these statements, these hadith, a lot of them are politically motivated. Um, one of the main narrators of these hadith is a person by the name of Abu Huraira. He was a companion of the Prophet for only two years. Um, the closest companions of the Prophet Muhammad regarded him as a liar and someone who wasn't to be trusted. Yet a large proportion of the prophetic traditions that are accepted by Sunni Muslims come from this guy, who Umar, uh, you know, a close companion of the Prophet or Aisha, uh, the wife of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, regarded as you know, someone who wasn't trustworthy. And this is a key part of Sunni Islam today. So if you look at the prophetic traditions, there are huge problems with them. And uh, you know, the bigger problem here is that Muslims base a lot of their understanding of their faith on these prophetic traditions. In fact, oftentimes much more so, they base their understanding of Islam on the Hadith than they do on the Quran. So you've got these traditions, like if you see the black banners coming from the direction of Khorasan, basically Central Asia, join that army even if you have to crawl over ice. You've all seen pictures of ISIS, what do they look like? They've got the black banners, they've got the seal of the Prophet Muhammad on them. So they're playing into this mythology um, and they're using, they're making reference to prophetic traditions like this um, to sort of say, you know, we are the people that the Prophet Muhammad foretold. Uh, if you, you can even go to who, p websites of people who are otherwise, you know, fairly well-meaning Muslim scholars who have compiled all of these kinds of prophetic traditions, these apocalyptic prophecies, and have, you know, assembled them in relation to what's been happening with ISIS, to say ISIS is the foretold group by the Prophet Muhammad. Um, and so s many young Muslims are quite confused. I mean, others are sitting back saying, well, if that's the Islam that... Uh, you know, is advocated, I don't want anything to do with it. Um, and others are saying, well, you know, if that's, the, um, if that's the prophecy, then there must be something good in ISIS, and maybe what the media is presenting is nonsense, is untrue. And keeping in mind, you know, many Muslims are quite sceptical of media representations, given their experiences with it over the past, you know, decade or so post 9-11. And the other issue we come to here is Islamophobia. Um, you know, that, that's something that uh, I think is sometimes overstated, but, you know, is a, is a real concern, particularly in Western societies. Many Muslims feel marginalised or alienated. Um, and if we think about post 9-11, um, obviously many young Muslims will have some identity issues. They feel as though they can't be accepted by Western society, they feel marginalised. They have religious leaders who reinforce this idea of us and them. They have political you know, our politicians get up there and say these things that make Muslims feel on the defensive. And so, you know, these, these are part of the reasons why groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda have some appeal. When you put all these factors together, um, it should be no surprise that a small proportion, albeit a small proportion, um, ha find appeal with um, groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda, etc. Now, just to sum up, uh, jihad that we spoke about right at the beginning means to strive, struggle, make an effort. Um, in the context of armed struggle, it was confined to self-defence, as far as the Quran is concerned. It was after the death of the Prophet Muhammad that jihad became a political tool uh, for empire, for the conquest um, and expansion of Muslim territory. This didn't necessarily mean that all people in all of these territories became uh, Muslims. 
That often happened hundreds of years later. But what we did see was the political expansion of Islam as a, as a political order, and as a social order to some extent. Um, Non-Muslims and un-Islamic Muslim rulers became primary targets of this new vision of, of jihad. The concept of caliphate, as I've explained to you, has no basis in the Quran or the prophetic traditions as a political system. It was invented by later Muslim scholars based on their interpretation of history. So they looked back at what happened during Muslim history and they uh, came to the conclusion that this now has an Islamic basis. It has an Islamic justification because towering figures like Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali you know, were the first caliphs, this kind of idea. A range of social and political factors today drive um, the contemporary uh, jihadist and, and, and caliphate groups. And I think we need a deeper understanding and investigation of these factors in order to have a better understanding of these issues of uh, jihadist and, and caliphate groups um, that we're encountering. Thank you.